All right, let's start and uh, just make sure that our doors will be closed very quickly. So uh, to introduce our panel for the mind gap uh, discussion, uh, I would like to introduce to you the following speakers, uh, our distinguished friends that are over here, Mr. David George, who is strategic planner with the Israel uh, National Cyber Directorate, um, Prime Minister's Office. Uh, his areas of responsibility include strategic assessment and policy setting on national cyber security affairs. He was previously a strategic planner in the IDF general staff, J5, where he was involved in a wide range of political, military issues, operating, operational planning, and multi-year force development. Mr. Evan Wolf, uh, who is a partner at Crowell and uh, Mooring LLP and US-based law firm, where he serves as co-chair of the Privacy and Cybersecurity Group. He advises companies on network security investigation coordination after intrusions, uh, data breaches and insurance issues. And uh, of course with us, Professor Paul Cornish, Associate Professor, Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center at Oxford University. Paul Cornish is Associate Director of Oxford University's Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center. Uh, he was educated at the University of St. Andrews, the London School of Economics and the University of Cambridge. Um, his work covers national strategy, cybersecurity, international security futures, arms control, the ethics of conflict, and civil military relations. Let's start. So, good afternoon, gentlemen, and good afternoon to the audience, those who chose to stay with us. Thank you. Um, this panel is actually going to delve into the gap between the policy and the technology. How do we cope with the fact that decision makers have to understand technology, which advances very quickly, uh, basically uh, creates uh, a domain where we as uh, politicians and bureaucrats have to find ways to create norms, to work on uh, uh, resolutions, uh, restrictions, or to encourage uh, activities. How do we bridge the gap between what is uh, be between the building blocks of technology and our regular policy planning. When we spoke earlier about the fact that uh, um, the GDPR, for example, which is widely discussed here, a very wide-ranging um, regulation of the European Union becoming an integral part of our lives, how do we really understand what it means? How do companies understand what that means? We understand we need to protect our privacy, and had it not been for the uh, Oxford uh, Analytica breach, I don't think, and the Facebook affair, we as individuals wouldn't have really understood the implications for our privacy of technology. So I would like each and every one of you to uh, address your perspectives on uh, this gap and how do you see, uh, which, what are the, the, the ways to, to bridge it? And I would like to ask you, Professor Cornish, perhaps to uh, start and introduce the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ido. Well, actually, I'd like to start, um, well, first of all, by thanking you for very much for inviting me to join this panel. I'm delighted to be here. Um, it, this is a topic that I've actually been working on for quite a lot of my career, when I, whenever I've been working in, in the area of cyber and so on. And uh, some time ago at Chatham House, when I set up um, a, a research program on cyber security, back then we were talking, as everybody was then and still is, about the the wonks versus the wonks and or versus the geeks, as it were. But back then, we, we talked about the securocrats versus the technorati, um, and the securocrats were the, were the ones who who didn't really like to talk to the to the geeks to the technorati because they they wore t-shirts rather than suits and they and they read mathematics and computer science rather than classics and history and so on. And the, and the technorati didn't like talking to government in case they were co-opted by the evil machine. So we had this sort of curious system of two ships passing in the night. But anyway, that's a digression. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is to begin your answer by not answering it, your question by not answering it, but by saying I think what we need to do, first of all, is go, in a sense, back to basics. I think we, by we I mean everybody, like everybody in this room who takes an interest in this vastly complex and vastly important and fast-moving topic, I think we need to improve the narrative. In other words, I think the first target of our bridging the gap discussions now ought to be um, public opinion and public uh, awareness, really, of what it is that we, um, we, we talk about so keenly. Um, I think we, we often uh, 
um, run the risk of creating our own little echo chambers that nobody else can really understand. And I, th understand. I think we need to work uh, better at that. So what I'd suggest, first of all, is that we need to introduce a sense of um, proportion into the discussion, uh, a sense of what um, cyberspace, if you want to use that expression, or the internet or whatever, uh, what it is and what it isn't. Um, it's not um, some dreadful disease that's about to infect us all. Um, it is what it is, a, 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 a marvellous opportunity, but it's not a gift of heaven either. It's not going to create a better humanity for all of us or any of that sort. It's, it, it's, it's a construct. It's an artefact. Um, and I think we need to, to start emphasising that, really, um, with a view to getting over the basic point that what we have here, at least for the time being, until AI really takes over and starts um, you know, creating something that is completely and utterly out of our, out of our control, as, as my uh, friend and colleague Chris Demchak, Demchak was, would, would say, um, I, I think we need to assert our human control over this human artifact. And if I think, I think if we can get some sense of that across in the public narrative, rather than the scare stories or the complacent, um, the complacent stories on the other hand, then I think that might be a good starting point. So that's my first contribution. Let's get the broad narrative right. We've been familiar with this thing, whatever we call it, the internet cybersecurity or global ICT or whatever you like, for long enough now to have a more responsible public debate about the, about the topic. Thank you very much. Uh, so, David, uh, from your experience, both in uh, government and the military, I think you've had uh, quite some experience in understanding and trying to cope with, with technology and understanding what are the implications for your area of responsibility. Why don't you share some observations from that point? Uh, thank you, Ido. Um, I'll start with... Um with uh, Jim's uh, historical analogy uh, that he gave, I think it's a good one about the, uh, the interwar years. I think that we are in a similar situation. What I identify uh, within the defense establishments is a ferment of, of intellectual thought about um, the changes that are happening. And, uh, and I think, though, that you know, we need to look at the corollary of that um, analogy. And that is that, uh, in the end, when both the Germans and the Allied powers were toying with the tanks and the planes and the radios. Uh, it was really only the Germans in the end that came up with the Blitzkrieg. And the uh, outcome was catastrophic, uh, certainly for our people. Um, and we can't discount the fact that we are heading in a similar uh, kind of dynamic. And in, in that case, the stakes are very high. And we need to um, think very carefully about how we uh, try and bridge this mind gap that, that uh, you spoke about. And one of the lessons I think that com comes out of that historic analogy, and I think many others, um, is that the gap is not necessarily one of who gets the technology when and how and, and uh, to what extent. Uh, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about that, talking about how we control tech transfer and how we might limit it and how we might uh, you know, uh, make sure that we have the technology first and they have it later or they don't have it at all and so forth. But I think that uh, the much better and more uh, interesting discussion to have, and a more important one, is um, assuming that everyone gets these technologies in the end, who's going to have the better strategy uh, to deploy and implement those technologies in a way that gains maximum strategic leverage? And I think that that discussion isn't being had enough. And one of the things that I think, uh, you know, as emerging technologies become more and more important, uh, in the outcomes of great power competitions is uh, are we institutionally built uh, in order to have that kind of discussion and develop those strategies? I mean, uh, you know, in the interwar years, uh, they had to rely on those individuals like the Billy Mitchells and the Guderians. Um, can we just really, uh, you know, hope that, that the system throws up the, those individuals? Or should we try and think of having some kind of institutions and processes in place? Um, I think that uh, Professor Cornish uh, mentioned uh, as a digression, but I think it's really uh, one of the, it goes to the heart of the matter, the, the dichotomy, right, between the techies or, and between the, the strategists. Um, I think it's built in from our, uh, fundamentally from our education systems, which, uh, you know, look at, uh, you either go down the path of uh, the, the uh, real sciences or you go down the path of the humanities and, and never the twain shall meet. Um, are we building the right kind of people uh, uh, with the right kind of uh, backgrounds? And I think it goes beyond the mundane of, you know, it's not just a matter of having uh, some kind of a STEM background. It, it, it goes uh, further than that. I think that uh, there are things uh, 
about the dynamics of technological change that the technologists themselves uh, are not very cognizant of and, um, and, and vice versa. And I think that today we don't yet have, at least in Israel I can say, um, a robust institutions and processes that will um, try and bridge that gap in, in a more systematic way. Um, going beyond that, I think that uh, uh, we need to develop new conceptual frameworks. Um, we need to have new methodologies. We need to um, think about how, I think the, the, the business strategists, for example, um, have some interesting concepts that we might be able to borrow, right? How these new technologies have value propositions and uh, um, uh, they have all sorts of models, you know, the S-curves and so forth. Maybe, maybe we can borrow something from them. Um, uh, but we need to see how we can incorporate those into the language that, uh, you know, we had in some of our slides up here of, uh, you know, the things that, that we in our echo chamber have of uh, escalation dominance and deterrence and uh, theories of victory and so forth. Um, and I think that one of, just to end with, an, with a final point, one of the very interesting uh, um, and uh, unprecedented uh, opportunities that could be had here is that some of these new technologies might actually change the way we actually think and innovate about strategy. Um, because some of these uh, technologies are looking at, uh, um, are, are touching on the way in which we uh, function cognitively and uh, the way in which we uh, interact or um, uh, draw assistance from uh, technological systems in order to think and innovate. And uh, it, I think that also strategists have to think about how we do strategy including using those technologies and how we experiment and simulate and, and so forth. Um, and I think that that at the moment is also very much a, um, an, an area that's open for, um, for development. All right, thank you, David. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, Evan, you have a personally very interesting experience of crossing the lines uh, <laughs> from technology to the private sector. Uh, and dealing with law. Um, why don't you share some observations from your perspective about that? Yeah, so uh, just from my background, I have a master's in geophysics and I spent the first 12 years of my career working first as an encryption analyst and then as a system engineer at the MITRE Corporation and then at the Department of Homeland Security. And since 2011, I've been a, a lawyer in the private sector and being involved in about a thousand data breaches, most of which both governments and shareholders and the private public sector do not know anything about because that's what I get paid to do is to help if there's no regulatory obligation my job is to make sure no one else knows about them um, so I guess in uh, since I'm a product of the 80s television I, I was I'm always told that I speak Romulan and Klingon it is sort of the the sorry I don't know if that translates into Hebrew very well and and I and I do want to start by giving one disclaimer and one thank you first of all, I want to thank you all for being here I thought we were about to ask the question that's never been asked can you have a panel without an audience and I'm glad we actually don't have to ask that question. And, and also, my disclaimer of the day is nothing I, I'm giving, no, no, nothing I'm telling you constitutes legal advice. If it does, please give me a few shekels afterwards and we'll consummate the relationship. Um, but I, I, I do, you know, I, I, it's funny because when I, when I heard Jim's, uh, 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 sorry, not, uh, analogy, I, I thought about it totally differently because we wouldn't have, we would never have won the war, we never would have had the ability to come up with really high level strategy if we wouldn't have had a very simple provision of the Defense Production Act, Section 702, which allowed the US government to work with the private sector in ways that they were legally forbidden from doing normally to produce all the armaments that allow us to win the war. If we wouldn't have entered into the voluntary agreements between Martin Marietta and US Steel and Alcoa, we would never have been able to produce one bomber per day. We would never have been able to produce the munitions. And that's what, and in, in, in addition to everything that Jim said, because I agree with the uh, sort of the universal truth of cybersecurity that Jim is always right. So along with the second, the, the prime directive that Dr. Nye is always right. Um, but. Uh, but I'll disagree with him in a minute on the whole Russia thing. Uh, but, but anyway, the, it's, but, but that is what I heard when I hear about the gap. I think about the gap between the, the, you know, the private sector and the government and what hasn't been represented so far is sort of what is the private sector doing in this? Because in the U.S., the number, the sort of, it's a mythical number. I describe it as sort of a unicorn-like number of 85% of the critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. There's no actual technical basis for it. But it is some really big number compared to, let's say, Russia, where Gazprom is not really privately owned, or in, in China, where, where CNOC and all the companies there that own critical infrastructure are, are, are clearly public entities. 
in the U.S. and along with the other 10%, as was described earlier, of, of the democracies, or if you include India, it's even more. Most of the infrastructure is privately owned, so it's a, it's a much different problem because we have to have a collective national defense, and that's where things like the Defense Production Act and how does government and industry work together. So how do the breaches that no one ever knows about but actually affect our national security, how do we work around those sorts of situations? And that's where I think there are, you know, a couple principles that, that, that we can sort of talk about and I'll quickly um, talk about a few of them and then, and then sort of yield the floor in case my gap is different than everyone else's gap because I, I, I think it kind of is. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I guess, you know, what I see is, is sort of not a strategy, but I'm, I'm you know, I guess my old, my old boss at DHS, Secretary Chertoff, always said, don't let, don't let the, it, it was quoted by others, don't let, uh, don't let the tactical get in, in the way of the strategic and the strategic get in the way of the tactical. And, and then uh, my other boss said, don't, no plan survives first contact. So, so we never bothered with uh, strategy back then. We just had to get things done when we were building DHS and when I was part of red teams. And, and the first piece is we need to start uh, building security into infrastructure. You know, the, the, the problem very simply is that I can go to Best Buy and, or the Israeli equivalent and for $300 I can buy one of these crack tops. You know, I can buy a computer that can quickly get infect, infected by a botnet willingly or unwillingly, put it on the internet, and, and then that sort of propagates the problem. And industry can do the same thing. And in fact, they're incentivized based on their shareholder model to do that, to buy less, less, less expensive infrastructure. And we need to reverse that model. I mean, this is why, you know, we have nothing but Apple devices in my, in my house. And I'm not saying that because Apple's a client, which they may or may not be. Um, and, and then we can get to some of the downstream problems like building smart regulations. I think we're not going to be regulating Facebook in a smart way. I'll just throw it out there. What, what, you know, that is a political play that, that, that Facebook, uh, you know, is, is leveraging with. So to prevent other companies from entering the field, it's not actually to regulate um, any, any sort of, uh, I, you know, any, any sort of uh, uh, actually security. And what we need to really focus on is the supply chain, because this is where we have a complete inequity. And this is not only just a U.S. issue, it's a global issue that if we look at the security of the supply chain, the, the, the primes, the companies that are actually producing whatever it is, whether it's the sort of endpoint of technology or a defense system or even a commercial system, it's always, you know, the sum is made up of all the parts and the parts are inherently cheaper and less secure than, than the piece we put together. Um, and then the last piece that I want to talk about, maybe I'll bring up some more later, but is, is the concept of we need to make security upgradable and adaptable right now, you know, with the exception of my Sonos, which is probably the cheapest piece of technology in my house. There is nothing else in my house that's completely upgradable that's in an existing system. And this is why I go to go to DEF CON every year and I'm, you know, the general counsel for the IOC Village because we need to start thinking about how we build security into the into the Internet of Things and as, as, as we start, um, you know, as, as we move down that path. Because without security and without the private sector, you know, leading the way, I think that's going to be a, a bigger challenge. And as I, uh, as I guess the, the voice of the private sector up here, which is a little funny given that I'm normally the voice of the non-private sector, but I'll, I'll end with, you know, if, if the internet was invented by, you know, DOD and, and DARPA, it was really monetized by those that figured out how to, to, to do things with it, not just sort of connect whatever it was, 14 computers in a, few, in a few universities. And that's where we need to remember that that's where some of the innovation is going to come from. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Uh, what you're saying actually um, is that human factor is something that is, of course, dominant in these developments. Um, the challenges are, uh, you described some of those challenges very, very uh, well, describing the, the structure that is necessary to move, methodology that is necessary to move from technology to strategy, um, or as you were saying, some bright minds that use the DARPA to create something that is, can, can be monetized. The question that I'd like to ask you is to think of an example of a particular instance where you see that a step was made by those who are not the technologists and uh, maybe more closer to the bureaucrats that were able to under better understand what technology is about. It could be because, uh, let's say, for example, the Wassenaar arrangement 
forces people to better understand what export controls are and therefore they have to understand a little bit more about technology, about cyber security. So they have to better understand how computers work and so on. Um, we understand that the Watson arrangement is a great example because it's still unresolved how to manage uh, you know, export control cyber. Um, so I'd like to uh, pick your minds a bit and think of a topic maybe that's an area which is completely impossible to get any traction in terms of advancing the uh, closing the gap or an area where you can uh, point to a success story. Uh, perhaps Professor Cornish, uh, you'd like to start. Um, that's, a, that's a bit of a killer question, Edu. Thanks very much. Um, so, I'll start off with appreciating the question, and then answer yeah, what, then a, what, what a, a what a very good question. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't. I can't. You haven't given me enough notice. I can't think. Is it a? Are we talking about a non-tech lead that's successful or that's not particularly successful? Anything. Well, what about the super, the supercomputer regime as a as a uh, an indicator of um, non-success? That's it. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure where we're going, what it is you're, you're fishing for, I'm afraid. Um, well, let's say uh, artificial intelligence, OK, or quantum computing. That's something that's completely new for the broad uh, public. Uh, however, you will need bureaucrats to take, to create some kind of uh, frameworks, maybe legal frameworks, regulation, uh, something that will help states maintain their responsibility for the security of their citizens. They have to understand technology. Mm -hmm. They have to understand what's going on there. They have to be able to make decisions about a situation, whether it's a risk or not, whether private companies should report it or not, uh, or they get under the radar. Uh, they have to understand technology somehow. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the gap. Uh, the question is, um, how do we get there? I mean, let's say that we're talking about diplomats. Myself, we are sitting in a room with Jim, and he tells us all kinds of things about norms. And, um, well, that's fine. Within the... Sorry? Yes, you can... No. But the question is, basically, uh, how, much do we, how much do we need to know about technology to take informed decisions uh, from your perspective? Let, 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 I'll try. I'll, I'll twist your question and answer it the way I want. Um, Go ahead. You Go know, ahead. if that's all right. Uh, but I think if we, and this is something I was, I was hoping to say actually. But if we, if we allow for the idea that, that, that the military are a sort of public servant, well, I suppose they are in a way, no doubt about it. Um, the, the point I want, and look, don't, I'm completely fascinated by innovation and military innovation. I was a soldier a long time ago. I began my career in the army, so I, I'm, I'm completely into this, and I'm completely understanding of the gravity of the strategic challenges that are um, presented by AI and the opportunities that AI might present in countering those challenges. But I'm very, very concerned at the moment um, that we might be getting the, to the point where uh, AI is becoming conflated with cyber war. And I kind of agree, I think, with Jim that that is a rather inane expression but certainly with cyber warfare, which is not a name, which is much more useful. Um, and, it, and it worries me. I, Paul Shah, I'm, I guess many people would have read his book, Army of One. Is it one or none? I'm, I'm, is it one? It is one. None. None. I, I've, I've got it at home, yet to read it. But anyway, I came across him being quoted, as you just gathered, uh, came across him being quoted in, in the latest um, UK um, MO, Ministry of Defence uh, doctrine think tank uh, publication on human machine teaming and he's quoted in these words the winner of the robotics revolution will not will not be who develops this technology first or even who has the best technology but who figures out how best to use it uh, and we're told that um, countries such as the US and Russia and China and so on are all uh, all have declared strategies to achieve uh, offset advantages through robotics uh, and AI offset being a very well known expression, a, a device with which to, uh, in a sense, to cover deficiencies in other areas. And in spite of your comment earlier, Elsa, I, I, do, I, I kind of agree with you that we're not, we're not in an arms race, but I think this is a good moment to think very carefully about the perils of arms racing. We could be in that sort of um, that approach to something. And I, and I think Joe's heard me say this before, but I do have a, a sort of nightmarish vision of automated um, misperception, mis miscalculation, and retaliation, and I can't stop thinking about 
Herman Kahn's doomsday machine from the early Cold War, uh, an, an idea that he dismissed, having floated it. But there was a legacy of it, and a more durable version of it was the, uh, the launch on warning idea. Uh, and we hear uh, Eric Schmidt uh, warning us that China will overtake America in AI by 2025. And I'm, I'm worried that what we're coming close to is, is a sort of 21st century version or, or um, analogy of, perhaps, of the, the 1960s missile gap, the AI gap, to which we'll respond by securitizing or militarizing AI and AR-related um, innovation while this whole thing is still maturing around us before we really know what we've got. So in other words, what we could be doing, just possibly at the moment, um, in order to deal with what does look to me, I guess to many of us, like a serious and imminent strategic challenge, what we could be doing is undermining possibly our long-term strength, which I think someone said earlier, does lie in the diversity of, uh, of our, um, our broad base of uh, research and development and innovation in AI, machine learning, human machine teaming, uh, quantum resistant encryption, and all of that sort of stuff. So that's my worry. I think we need to be thinking, um, let's call it prophylactically, about this sort of stuff, because we know we've been there before. Um, I guess can I add a two finger in because I think um, the concept of regulating AI, I mean, we've sort of been through this rodeo before. I guess I'm, I describe myself as part of the first crypto wars in the U.S. when we tried during the burn. And there's a famous case called Bernstein versus U.S. where we were trying to regulate and stop the export of, uh, of strong encryption, which of course could be written on a T-shirt or posted on a. a bulletin board, as we used to call them back then in Sweden, and uh, and then we eventually were, were, were able to. So regulating, you know, and, until we came up with a, a better regulatory approach, which now we use export control on, on data and think about it a little differently. So I, I do think we need to be careful about that approach. But I, I, I think the, um, you know, just to uh, uh, sort of, since, since, we, since this is, I think, the only panel for risk of that actually ever talked substantively about GDPR, I'll talk about it for a second. Because um, I think GDPR will historically go down as the Drosophila, the, the fruit fly of, of regulations. Because I don't think, I think it's going to be, you know, historically viewed as not very substantive. All we're doing is regulating a thin amount of data in, you know, these global companies that doesn't actually entirely protect individuals privacy or the secure or in any way the security of the companies and so I, I think it'll be maybe a useful half step but that's about all, all it will be um, I, I do think what it highlights is that we as, as sort of I, I'm still sort of a very you know I'm still uh, enough jet lag that I can still think about things only as a sort of a US perspective or maybe from an Israel perspective or a global perspective you know, we globally don't understand the value of data and we don't understand who owns data. And that's what GDPR will teach us is sort of how to properly value and understand the a regulatory model for data, which is that that in many ways is more important than whatever the technology, if it's AI or something else. Because in the US, we've have a very interesting tipping point that occurred, you know, sometime over the past few years when it was, I don't know, and no one really knows. But um, it used to be that a simple piece of a U.S. infrastructure like pipelines were operated all manually. When you wanted to change a pipeline or move a pipeline, you would send people in pickup trucks to open and close valves. A couple of the valves would be automated if they were small valves. The big valves would still be manual. Well, that no longer is the case. In fact, there are more automated pipelines than unautomated pipelines in the U.S., and that's true for a lot of other of the advanced countries. So now we no longer have the team of people that can go to pickup trucks and know how to operate them. And so we've had this tipping point with a small subsector of our infrastructure. Some would view this as sort of a, uh, you know, this, this challenge of, of, of data and security. But, but actually, from, from the GAP perspective, I think if we actually build security into how we manage those pipelines, we can actually end up with something that is more resilient, more durable than we would have been if we would have stayed with the, the manual system or to those countries that are, are still trying to bridge that, that sort of automation and digital divide. I think you know we can and will end up with a, a stronger position, but we need to understand sort of the role of, of data and automation in this process, and really who owns it. And that's that's you know you know to my 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 GDPR as a fruit fly, you know that's why I think it's it's going to be only consequential for a while until we sort of 
as, as sort of a society and a, and a globe understand this broader role of, of data. And that's, I mean, I, I think that's the, a, a real challenge. Uh, I think there are no end of examples uh, to, uh, that you're looking for. Um, I'll give two and one looking ahead. Um, a good example of a success that's contemporary and that's uh, you know, uh, fresh in all of our minds is, uh, is Russia in cyber in uh, 16 and 17. Um, I think that there's no special reason to think that the, I mean certainly not in the tools they deployed, that they uh, had had or used technologies that were more sophisticated than those of the US um, at the time. And, uh, but they were the ones, the Russians were the ones that put their finger on um, the utility of a cyber influence as a method of, of uh, gaining maximum strategic leverage. And this would be a victory for the concept, uh, you know, as opposed to the technology. Um, an example of a failure, um, you know, on a, on a large scale would be the internet. Uh, the internet was uh, um, uh, built without really any uh, systemic understanding of, uh, of how attack and defense will, uh, will play out over it. Um, and as a result, it was built without security by design. And uh, looking ahead, um, I will use a uh, little argument that was here uh, on this stage uh, a couple of panels ago um, about what is the best approach to infuse our societies with AI, right? Is it uh, the Chinese approach, uh, top-down, centralized, uh, comprehensive, all-inclusive, uh, or uh, the US approach, free markets, uh, compartmentalized, haphazard, um, and capped by uh, individual rights and privacy? And, uh, and I would, you know, then ask the question, well, you know, taking the lessons from the building of the internet, um, would you, what would be the right architecture to build a, an AI, uh, a societal AI that is, or many AIs that are defensible, right? So if I were to be a cyber influence warrior, and I were to look at the way the Chinese are building their uh, AI architecture, I would be rubbing my hands together and I'd be saying, well, you know, I could make Cambridge Analytica look like child's play, you know. Um, so, you know, maybe I should be encouraging them, you know, go right ahead. Um, but the, the, I think the real point is that we haven't um, yet come to the point in our um, strategic thinking and planning as states um, where we can really think about that in a systematic way, in a way that can really inform decision making. Uh, in a meaningful way, um, and uh, and I, I I don't see right now uh, where the locus is uh, for that kind of discussion to, to be had to be had in a way that influences decision making on 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 that level. Um, I see uh, people you know uh, in strategy who, when you ask them about emerging technologies, they point their fingers at the R and D guys and say, yeah, they're, they're, they'll deal with it, right? And you go to the R and D guys and you say, well. Um, you know, what are the most important uh, technologies? And they shrug their shoulders and say, look, we work on the most interesting programs, so we're waiting for the strategy guys to come and give us the future concept of operations, and then we can calibrate our programs to that end. Um, and, uh, and we haven't yet come to the point where uh, there is a, 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 either a single uh, a body that is, um, a, a has the, both the expertise and the responsibility to, to make that discussion happen, or the processes by which those two will be able to um, come together and have that discussion in a, in a, a future-oriented um, but systemic and design uh, way. Um, and uh, looking at the national level, I can give the example, well, in Israel we have a national security council and we have a national economic council, but we don't have a national emerging tech council. And maybe we need one, right? We have all sorts of ad hoc committees, including the one that recommended uh, the establishment of the organization in which I now work, uh, but that was ad hoc, um, and now there's another ad hoc one uh, happening um, for a bunch of other technologies, but not others. So, you know, where is the uh, the locus in which that discussion is happening, and we and where we can focus it? I think is an important thing to de to uh, to define. Uh, well, David, I think you hit the hammer on the head. Uh, this is really the question that uh, we should be wondering about. I think in 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 many respects in creating. Not only talking about cybersecurity, but much broadly speaking, how do we cope with technology? Um, Paul, what's your perspective on this? I think it's a very interesting point that uh, David made. Well, that was a, sorry, I'm not, I'm not giving up. All right. What, exactly, uh, what, what, what are you asking? Uh, what I'm asking is actually uh, how do we cope from a, from a structural, governmental point of view, 
with the fact that we need to connect between different developers of technologies, yeah. uh, regulators, uh, security people, uh, educators, a very broad uh, group of people who are influential on technology, either from the private sector or government sector, is it possible to create some kind of a joint mechanism? I, I was thinking as David was talking that, that really it, it was ever thus. Um, I'm not sure that at any moment of you know, massive innovation we've ever had a committee of, of the nation that sat down and said, let's work it all out and who's going to get what and what are the various interests and what, what are the compromises and so on. I think we've always, um, to use an expression I use a lot when I'm describing the UK national security system, we've always muddled through. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a good pedigree in muddling through. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I think that, that does still obtain. So I, I, can't, I can't imagine, um, actually, there being any, any single locus of advice and, and research that could, um, could do the job that I think, you, you know, you've already put your finger on, but I'm not sure that there's any solution out there. Other than something, I think it might have been Chris earlier mentioned, or, or several people mentioned the, 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 the need for a whole of government approach. I mean, you know, surely that is, is it's got to lie in there somewhere in interdepartmental and interagency um, collaboration, which is something that, again, what, the case I know best about, of course, is the UK. Um, and that's really been a, a very constant theme in the last three, yeah, the last three national cybersecurity strategies is gradually bringing the whole thing together with the cabinet office, this curious department that we have at the centre of our government, acting as a, in a coordinating function rather than the leadership function, um, and really trying to bring all essential and involved and interested uh, departments of government together in one more or less um, uh, conversational lump at the centre of government, but you know more or less, but with no real direction from anybody, just hoping for the best. Um, We've seen one major step in the last, I think, about a year ago when our, our um, intelligence, um, our, uh, signals intelligence, GCHQ, Government Communications yeah. Headquarters, moved a large part of its operation into London in the National Cyber Security Centre. And that is now acting as a, a more operational hub for everything that's going on in London. Um, but really what you're dealing with is, I think, uh, learning by doing, um, working it out on the job. And I, I, I think that's the only way to do it. All right. Uh, let's say you were an advisor to the government and this kind of a body, the idealistic body, would be put in place. What would your advice be for them, for their objective? What should they be really aiming at? I'm not talking about cybersecurity, but more in a broader technological sense. Should the public become more technology savvy or should the... Uh, uh, system of government and private sector be somehow amended to accommodate the requirements of the uh, technologies, the innovators and so on. Uh, does the balance need to change between uh, what we know as a, a modern liberal state, democracy? I, I think this is something actually I, do, I talk about quite a lot when I'm in the UK, but I, I think I, I think there does need to be an, an improved relationship between government and um, science and innovation in the UK, and I guess in lots of other countries. Uh, and in other words, I think there needs to be a much closer relationship in, in science and innovation. I think the best way to, you need a currency for that, and the best currency is currency. Uh, in other words, um, what government has got to do is to be willing, and it's a difficult proposition to make, especially at the moment in the UK, because we've got no money to do anything. Um, what government has to do is to invest more in innovation at risk. And it's the at risk bit that is always so difficult. What we're doing in the UK is calling it innovation when really what we're doing is, is uh, adopting fast and integrating when everybody else has innovated. Uh, and we're picking it up. And that I don't think is healthy. It's in a sense, it's what China has done for decades. You know, they copied and brought it in and, in, and integrated very fast. And I think in a way we're, we're sort of going backwards in that regard. Um, so what I keep saying is that actually what government needs to be doing is being willing to waste money. So uh, I, 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 um, I think that's a, a great question and I think it sort of points out what I call the Scud missile problem we have in the US because uh, once again to pick on just pipelines because they're easy to understand. Um, the biggest threat to pipelines in the US is not bin Laden or terrorism or even you know, advanced persistent threats. It's really 
third party damage. Sometimes we used to call this bubble with a backhoe. It's someone digging in their backyard, digging up a pipeline, and that causing a, a, a failure that they then have to manage down the road. That's really difficult to manage. We've developed a lot of complex administrative and technical ways from calling before you dig, regulating. So it's been something that, that as a country we've been dealing with for a while. But what we've realized that more than you know, individuals digging in their backyard, if a, there was a single Scud missile defense within the United States, that would do catastrophic damage to the pipeline system for which it would take a very long time to, to recoup. In the U.S., we don't really, there's no single pipeline company that cares about that. I don't have any companies that have pipeline defense systems because we realize DOD and other, and CBP, when they're doing other things than they're doing right now, are going to be taking care of protecting companies from getting SCUD missiles in the U.S. and from operationalizing them. And that's this, that's this sort of shared risk model that we have in other parts of our infrastructure that we have not been able to adopt in, in the security area. And that's sort of where I think we need to think about what does shared risk mean? Why is it that, that companies that don't have to worry about, you know, SCUD missiles have to worry about Chinese-based malware? And, and that's really the, the challenge that sort of the private sector has to, has to deal with it, that I think we need to sort of have a better balance of where does security start and who is responsible, both at the nation state level and, and, and globally. I think, I think there is, um, you know, I think just to, co to go back to, 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 I guess, reinterpret what Jim said for the third time, um, when we look at sort of the, you know, the idea that there's a, a, a that, that, that the Chinese haven't been successful in, in, in attacking the U.S. and or will they want to attack, attack U.S. infrastructure, I argue that they are successful every time they put a remote access Trojan or some sort of malware on a U.S. piece of infrastructure, establish a command control network so they can then communicate and, and get data off the network. Maybe the data is not used operationally right away, but, but I argue you know, that, that that is a successful attack. It doesn't mean that they have to turn off the lights and they have to do something with it. Maybe that goes into building the next set of armaments that they're building. Maybe it goes into building their infrastructure. But if, that's, if, if I'm right, which I'm probably not since, once again, prime directive is Jim's usually right. Um, but, if, but if I am right in this one case, that means that we really need to think about how we're going to manage this risk in a way that we're not doing it right now. And, and I think DOD is, in the U.S., DOD has started down this path in 2000 through 13 through 2016. They developed a regulation that, that's impacted 45,000 companies, requiring them to spend, you know, easily in the billions, if not tens of billions of dollars, and implement a set of actual technical, 110 technical controls. And so we are doing it in bits and pieces. We're just not doing it in sort of what I call sort of an egalitarian way. Uh, my advice in this hypothetical uh, scenario that you put, um, it might sound uh, a little bit out there, but um, and maybe a little more technocratic than what you might expect. But um, I would, uh, in, I would advise the setting up not of a committee, um, but of uh, some kind of a national um, test bed or uh, you know, going in with your uh, innovation. But instead of doing it like uh, Google with the move fast and break things, um, is some place where we could have large scale simulations um, of, uh, of complex systems. Um, uh, in which uh, machines and humans interact um, in uh, all sorts of variations and permutations and combinations and uh, in ways that could be simulated in over and over again in different ways. Um, and I think that with those kind of games and simulations and, and so forth, we could uh, probably learn a lot without having to do and take risks in the real world um, and, uh, and, and accelerate our innovation. Thank you very much. Um, before we finish and, and any questions from the audience? Yes, please, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Dov, I'm a uh, freelance software developer. Um, we did, we, we've been discussing, we've been hearing about uh, bridging uh, uh, the gap. And bridging gaps is a fairly, if not uh, old, if not ancient uh, uh, kind of challenge. Bridging this specific gap is a new challenge, but, but it's only because it's a new technology. Government has been bridging gaps for, for as long as governments have, have been in existence. Uh, and the customers, the consumers, don't really have a say in what, uh, or they have a very small say in what gaps uh, uh, government will, uh, will be chasing next. 
and if they want to stay in touch with their friends, they are going to be on Facebook, they are going to be using Google, and while the papers cry foul and have been doing so at least for the past decade and a half, or let's say decade, uh, government has not been picking up. Uh, uh, Evan, uh, Evan it is, right? You've mentioned uh, the uh, uh, putting uh, some, if not all, of the uh, responsibility on the private sector, and that's what I interpreted what, what you said to say. The pro it should be driven by the pro it should be driven by the companies uh, by the product, and I've heard that notion earlier on today in, in a different track. Companies are incentivized by making a profit. There is no profit in adding more testing for security. There is no profit in adding more uh, software to uh, to close uh, to close security gaps. The only way they would be incentivized would be by government, which leads me back to where I started off. Since bridging gaps is not new, only this specific gap is. What can be taken from previous gaps that have been that have been bridged in order to uh, in order for government? to bridge this specific one? It's a, it's a really great question. And, and I think there are two really great examples, and this is, I guess, the part of the panel where we can do cyber by analogy for a few minutes, since that seems to be sort of how we all think about cyber these days. Um, and, and, and the first is, you know, we went through this very mythical time period in the 1960s, early 70s in the US, where we asked the entire industry that was responsible for producing everything from plastics to energy to internalize a series of externalities of clean air, clean water, and, and, and management of hazardous waste. Before that time period, companies didn't spend any money on that. And after that time period, by the late 70s, they were spending in, in, the, in, in the modern day equivalent of trillions of dollars on, on that. So we went through this time period where we had companies internalize these externalities of, of, of clean air and clean water. Right now, I would argue companies are not spending the money that they that they, they get out of, you know, storage of data, you know, secure access to to the internet, and other other types of, of externalities that they they really haven't internalized. So I think that is, you know, part of what what we need to do, and that requires sort of, as I said earlier, sort of smart regulations, not regulating Facebook, but actually looking at the supply chain, thinking about it more like what DoD is doing with with the implementation of the NIST 800-171. But the other part piece of this that is, I think, really instructive of how, I think, where this road is going is what we did with the transportation infrastructure in the US. Because, you know, the, the truth is there is still no federal, uh, just as there's no federal data breach law, there's no federal speed limit. Speed limits are set by states. They're incentivized based on money that the states get from the federal government. But we've been able to create a system where cars get regulated by an agency. And I wouldn't say this is efficient by any stretch, so just to be clear. But we have a regulatory system where we can you know, have people that are licensed and trained drivers put in cars that are safe and tested cars on a system, on a highway transportation system that, that also follows a set of, of, of decent, albeit expensive, regulations. And that's something that involves both the private sector, state, federal government. So I think we, we just need to think about the scope of the problem a little bigger, and that's where we can start coming up with these broader models of, of how to regulate. But I'm, I'm sure many people will disagree with me, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike. Um, thanks. Yes, I, I thought it was a super question as well. Thank you for that. I think you're right. It is a very old challenge. And it just it seems to me that, we've, um, that, that most bridging has almost sort of happened um, naturally. Uh, you know, we've gone to sleep and woken up and the bridge has grown a bit overnight. You know, it happens of its own accord almost, or it happens through usage. And I, I guess that's part of the problem uh, because we don't think there's enough time at the moment. Uh, we're all in a rush because we're rather panicked about this problem of there being uh, these persistent bridges between the various sectors we're all talking about. Uh, so we've got to get on with it. And I think it's also, and I go back to the point I made right at the beginning, I think there is there is a, a bit of a deficiency in the public debate or public understanding. I don't want to sound very patronising about this. I mean, you know, I began my academic career as an historian, so, you know, leave me alone. Um, but but I, th I think there is a deficiency in the public debate uh, such that there's not that sort of that inclination to bridge, perhaps. So th there's something there to, to, um, to, to worry about. But the other thing I'd, I'd, I'd throw into this discussion is that um, if... If the natural bridging um, function is going to take too long, uh, and if usage is just somehow a bit constipated at the moment, then there is something you can do, which is you can nudge it 
uh, and of course the one thing that can begin to nudge behavior and, um, and bridge building is the gradual introduction of insurance and risk, writing risk and liability into this whole debate. And I, I'm sure we've all been to these conferences and we've heard that, you know, risk, uh, that insurance is, is coming in and insurance, reinsurance is coming in a little bit more cautiously even than insurance. But I think those things are going to change the entire character of this discussion over the next 10 years or so. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're out of time. Um, I would like the audience to join me in thanking our distinguished speakers for the contribution. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, Lior will uh, make some closing remarks. Please go ahead. It's a very short closing remark. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I have a new criterion for a successful event when you are uh, invested so much intellectual effort into thinking that you are tired. And I think we are tired. We could continue to do this for a couple of more days, but maybe next time, hopefully, we'll see you next year at Cyber Week. And in between, uh, because we don't only do conferences, we do research and all the related activities. So please keep in touch and enjoy uh, tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>